So I'm, I am, I'm not actually going to talk too much about the kind of queer kinship stuff that, that I have written about in other places today. Um, today I was going to focus on uh, the question of, um, I'm going to start from the, the question of plastic geology. So um, I, in, in addition to the two edited books, um, that uh, one is one um, was out last year, and then the next one uh, will be coming out um, in a year from now. Um, my major research project at the moment is about plastic, and um, I started getting fascinated with plastic because of all kinds of reasons. But one of one of the primary reasons is because of the way in which it becomes uh, this object where um, we are incredibly intimate with with oil production and with, with um, oil in our everyday lives. Um, so the thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, plastic geologies. And I mean, uh, this might go in some um, kind of strange directions, uh, hopefully. Uh, so I wanted to start um, with this quote from Bernadette um, Benson Brisson. Um, who's a philosopher of science, a Belgian philosopher of science, and she writes, our plastic age confronts the issue of duration. The ephemeral present of plastics is not just an instant detached from the past and the future. It is the tip of a heap of memory, the upper layer of many layers of the past that have resulted in crude oil stored in the depths of the soil and the sea. Plastics really belong to Bergson's duration. They cannot be abstracted from the heterogeneous and irreversible flux of becoming. The present is conditioned by the, by the accumulated traces of the past, and the future of the earth will bear the marks of our present. While the manufacture of plastics destroys the archives of life on the earth, its waste will constitute the archives of the 20th century and beyond. Um, and I just, I love this quote. I think it's incredibly um, provocative. Um, and I love it because of its literalness. Um, plastic really will constitute the archives of the 20th century and beyond. Um, of all of the things that we've manufactured in the world, um, it is certainly one of, one of the things that's going to um, live on long beyond us. But the other thing is this kind of strange sort of tension that becomes apparent in the quote um, around the question of the continued insistence on becoming and the notion of duration. So even though there's this idea that we have, that we're going to have this archive that to a certain extent will um, carry this legacy forward, there's always this kind of process that's built into that. It's not a static archive, nor could it ever be. Um, and that, I think, um, is a really interesting thing. And, and the, the, the fact of its becoming, the fact of its processual nature is what connects it up to questions of memory, not just human memory, but memories of the earth, memories of other animals. Um, so uh, so those, are the, those are the places that I would like to start. Um, so, uh, and, um, so plastic is one of the indicators of the Anthropocene, so uh, one of the sort of um, proposed markers of the Anthropocene. Um, and I start with this image um, because this piece of plastic was actually found not that far from here. Uh, it was found um, uh, in the... Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we were, but we were in Kilpisjärvi, and then we, when we went north in Finland, and then we went north and we crossed, um, and we were in Norway. But uh, so, so you know, quite close to where we where we are now. And the actual object was about um, this big, and uh, Perdita found it and she photographed it, and it has this crazy quality where it really does look like a meteorite, and she just found it on the beach. And one of the things, um, I think it's such a, um, an indicator of the, of the way in which um, plastic has circulated on the globe. So, um, so one of the crazy things about plastic is that it's incredibly mobile. So as opposed to ceramics, which took thousands of years um, to achieve anything resembling a global distribution, um, uh, and the, and ceramics are mainly uh, found in terrestrial deposits rather than um, in the oceans or in waterways. Uh, plastics actually can be found anywhere on Earth, including the Arctic and the Antarctic. There is no, there is literally no place on Earth uh, that can be said to be plastic free, um, and that includes the in, insides of our own bodies. So. Um, I think that, that this, uh, so this is one of the reasons why um, geologists uh, are indicating that it could be one of the potential markers of the Anthropocene because of its geologic distribution um, and because of things like this, sorry, this image is 
kind of terrible, but um, I couldn't find a better one, um, which is that you can actually see the layer <laughs> Where, where this like plastic layer um, in the in what is called an anthrosol, which is um, a completely or nearly completely human made soil, um, and there's this kind of amazing way in which you can go across the surface of the earth, and you can you, the anthrosol will will rise or um, fall depending upon uh, human activity in that area. But it's a it's another kind of way in which to understand geography. So instead of just understanding geography in relationship to um, where continents are, or, you know, or uh, national borders, this kind of thing, you can also think of it in terms of the depth of human marking. Um, and that includes all kinds of other things, obviously, besides just plastics. It includes ceramics and other kinds of objects. But it also includes all of the chemical residues that are found. So everything from uh, nuclear radiation to uh, the use of agriculture, uh, um, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, but one of the things, um, and so this is, this is another one of those um, moments of of sort of strange uh, congruence between plastics and geology. This is um, a plastic glomerate, with, which is, uh, the, and the other example was at the very beginning, under the plastic geologies. Um, and a plastic glomerate was coined by um, Patricia Corkin, who's a geologist, uh, Kelly Jazvac, who's the artist who took this uh, photograph, um, and uh, Captain Charles Moore, who is the person who discovered what is um, colloquially, no colloquially known as the Great Garbage Patch out in the North Pacific Gyre. Um, and the three of them traveled to Kapilo Beach on Hawaii. Um, and as they were there, they started noticing these rocks um, or you know what they what they what they submitted to the geological society as a kind of a rock, um, which is uh, they call it an indurated material, which basically just means that it's melted plastic that's fused with all of the other uh, debris on the beach, so sand and wood and all these other kinds of things, to create a new form of a rock. Um, and this these rocks were actually produced um, by human activity, um, by mainly from campfires on the beach. But one of the ways in which they happen is that it's not like they were, um, you know, campers who were just like discarding their plastic stuff into the fire. It was rather that there's so much plastic on that beach that if you have a fire anywhere, it creates these plastic rocks because there literally is no place on this beach that is that that doesn't have that amount of plastic in it. Like it, there's a huge amount of, of plastic on this beach, and it's just because Hawaii is located very close to one of the gyres. So when plastics enter into the ocean, they get swept up in the currents that you know everything in the ocean um, follows and um, and just because of its particular geographic location, everything kind of swirls around and then washes up um, on this particular beach. So, um, so here, plastic is literally becoming a rock. Um, and why, why do I think that this is sort of interesting or important? Um, one of the things, one of the ways in which I've been thinking about this is in terms of what's called a metabolic rift. So, um, the meta uh, metabolism is obviously what, what does the processing, right? And, and we can think about um, a planetary me metabolism as metabolizing the compounds of, of, of elements and compounds. So you can think about the kind of the circulation of molecules, the circulation of particular kinds of um, uh, chemistries, the circulation of particular kinds of um, uh, biological characteristics um, that, that actually where the Earth literally metabolizes it. So, I mean, this is where we get oil in the first place, right? You can think about that as a kind of me metabolic process. So all of these creatures die and they get squished for thousands of years. And then out of this becomes this other, this other material. So, I mean, that is the process of metabolism. Now, what plastic does or what, what, the, what the metabolic rift refers to is the widening of the fact that, that um, the changes in the distribution of planetary ke chemistry are causing a widening of this rift. So the ways in which carbon is circulating is becoming more and more problematic. Um, and not just because more and more is going into the atmosphere, but because more and more is going into the oceans, causing ocean acidification, but also because we're reaching um, peak capacities in certain places for plants to be able to absorb the amount of carbon dioxide that's being put, put out into the atmosphere. So because we have unearthed all of this material that um, 
that was in the ground and therefore released its energy, there's this way in which carbon sinks actually don't even function in the way that they should anymore. So that, that can be understood as this process of metabolic rift. Um, phosphorus is another amazing example of this because um, phosphorus production is actually finite on the planet. Unlike nitrogen, which we can pull from the air, phosphorus we actually have to um, either mine or um, it gets produced by our own bodies when you... and ingest you know, plants or animals or whatever, um, you will release phosphorus um, in your urine, but it's a lesser amount. So because of the fact that we don't have phosphorus, mechanisms of phosphorus capture, we're, we're dependent upon mining processes in order to get more and more phosphorus, which is one of the key components of industrial agriculture, one of the components of any kind of um, plant-based uh, growth, but, but particularly um, is important in industrial agriculture. And because we're doing this, we're actually setting ourselves up for um, a huge kind of crash in, in agricultural processes. So this is another kind of metabolic rift, right? That we're using up so much of this stuff that there's no way in which for it to actually recirculate in the manner in which it might otherwise. So, um, so in becoming, so plastic obviously is a part of this, um, of this, uh, uh, metabolic rift, and it's it's designed to be so, right? I mean, plastic is designed to be biocidal, um, meaning that it kills off biological materials, um, and it's and it's designed um, to be a protective barrier. I mean, this this is what we use it for. We use it in hazmat soups. I mean, we use it in saran wrap. We use it in all of these things. Um, this is one of my favorite examples of. Um, the sort of protective layer of, of plastics. So for those of you um, who've been to LA, this is the Silver Lake Reservoir. Um, and in, I believe this event took place in uh, 2008, although I could be wrong about that date. Um, but, uh, but so the city of Los Angeles realized that, um, that they had this problem where um, carcinogenic bromide was being produced because bromine is found naturally in the water and when it's exposed to sunlight, um, it turns into bromide. And when, when that happens, um, it becomes a carcinogenic material. And this uh, reservoir um, was feeding, you know, uh, was being distributed amongst millions of people in southern Los Angeles. So uh, clearly this was a, a huge health issue. So there's, their solution was to... Um, purchase uh, millions of uh, these balls, which are polyethylene, black polyethylene balls um, that are called shade balls. And they are originally produced for the oil industry to keep um, birds and other uh, creatures off of the kind of reservoirs that of, of, um, of effluent that, that uh, gets produced as a byproduct from, from oil production. Um, but they bought these uh, for two reasons. One is it cancels out the effect of the sunlight. Obviously, the, the, sun, the sun then just bounces off of these balls rather than being absorbed into the water. And so it, it uh, stops the problem of the bromide production. Um, but it also uh, is, is helpful in terms of algae growth and um, <coughs> Uh, and in terms of water evaporation. So when this was meant to be a temporary measure as the city of Los Angeles is building underground reservoirs, but in the meantime, they've also actually decided to um, purchase something like 22 million of these balls uh, to be distributed across um, an either, even larger reservoir um, that they have, which is called the LA Reservoir. Um, and this is, this is actually gonna be a permanent solution to the problem. Um, and so, you know, and the whole question of, of what's leaching into the water by way of these um, plastic balls that are being continually exposed to a lot of sunlight and that are going directly into waterways is, um, so as far as I can tell, not something that they are asking about. Um, but, uh, but, but one of the things that I find so fascinating about this example, I mean, there's lots of things. There's these incredibly, incredibly beautiful other images that you can find of this event where, where it really looks like um, it's, it's some kind of massive uh, performance art. Um, <laughs> but it isn't. It's just the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, but, but, uh, but it really does look like art in this, in this kind of fascinating way. So there's a strange congruence between uh, kind of a contemporary art aesthetic um, and, the, and the mechanisms 
of, of capture the mechanisms in which um, we are producing an industrialized present or the re responding to the problems of an industrialized present. But the other thing is obviously because of its coding capacity. So um, plastic you know, really is meant to be this uh, alternate surface. Um, and and, and this, this illustrates it really well. Um, and I'm just gonna read one, one little quote in relationship to the, to the question of metabolism and coding, um, which is from Michael Hart, who um, is linking the relations of, of capital to plastic. And he says, accumulation is always against metabolism and against use. I mean the dream of the permanence of money, of an infinite ability to accumulate value without its degrading. The end point of accumulation, and specifically the accumulation of plastic, is the death of metabolism. And that's um, exactly what, what I'm um, arguing in relationship to, to plastic and metabolism. Plastic is something that endlessly accumulates, but that has um, this biological reality where uh, it, it is incredibly resistant to any form of um, metabolization. So um, plastic can be seen as the per perfected materialization of, the, of this desire for accumulation without metabolism. So, uh, the, a sort of perfected material, um, um, a, a perfected material desire for the end point of petrocapitalism. Um, so it endlessly accumulates, spreading itself over the entire surface of the earth, throughout the oceans, and embedded in the geologic strata, while creating a sealant or barrier for breath, metabolism, and chemical exchange, um, which you can see in this unintended consequence. Um, this is the Sitaram River in Indonesia. There's been a lot of efforts to try to clean this up. So what, from what I gather, it doesn't look quite as um, devastatingly awful as it does here. Um, but the, the, what has happened is because there is so much plastic um, detritus um, because Indonesia doesn't have uh, proper um, waste management systems for dealing with the amount of plastic that's being produced, as I would argue most countries um, don't. Um, but um, but it, here it's particularly visible. And there's so much plastic on the surface that the water below has actually become anoxic, meaning that fish and other uh, plants um, can't live there anymore. Um, and this, so this is another kind of... Um, this is, you know, this is another fallout from this uh, lack of being able to metabolize. Um, and so Marx also used uh, metabolism to talk about the evolution of human behavior and labor. And he described metabolism as a process between man and nature, a process by which man, and sorry for the gendered uh, terminology, these are his words, not mine, um, through his own action, mediates, regulates, and controls the metabolism between himself and nature. And I find that a particularly interesting way to think about these kinds of relations. So it's not, so the earth is metabolizing all of the substances, Organisms are metabolizing the outside and bringing them into our bodies, creating this kind of barrier between the outside and the self by way of a metabolic process. But also the products of labor are doing the same thing. So the ways in which we are interacting with our environments, the ways in which the ways in which um, we create particular processes or particular technologies rather than other ones also indicate particular kinds of metabolic processes. Um, so. Um, with plastic, I would argue, we've deliberately stopped a lot of the metabolic processes, the metabolic processes of the earth, um, the metabolic processes of our own um, biologies, and instead we're inducing a kind of geologic indigestion. Um, so to introduce another um, sort of uh, way in which to think about um, the question of metabolism, um, Hannah Landecker has written this amazing article called The Metabolism of Philosophy, um, in which she talks about uh, one of the ways in which um, you can understand the process of becoming an individuated organism is because of the process of me metabolization. So even though our bodies are constantly in flux, um, all of our individual genes are, are turning over, all of our individual cells um, are actually, uh, you know, they don't, they don't 
there's no, no cell in our body that is going to be there from the moment you're born to the moment you die. Everything, everything is constantly actually in flux in terms of your own organism. So how, how does it maintain any kind of consistency? And how does that actually become differentiated from the surrounding the, the, its surrounds. And she argues that the way in which that happens is through this process of metabolization. But because it's a process of metabolization, you're essentially enfolding the world into yourself, right? Or, or I mean, I say oneself, but I mean, it could be, it could be any organism. So, um, so the question, how do organisms eat other organisms and yet persist as themselves? The answer, organisms persist by converting the world into themselves. So our bodies are literally the kind of infolding of the external, external world. Everything that's out there um, become, um, uh, gets transferred inside of us. So all of, the, all of the kinds of chemicals that are, we're distributing across the planet, the ways in which we've blocked other kinds of meta meta met metabolic processes from happening, um, all of those things, all of the residue of that then gets ba refolded back into our own organisms and the organisms of all the other creatures on the planet. Um, so... Um, how did this sort of come to be? Um, what you see on the right here is um, all of these tiny little pieces of plastic that were found um, on, the, on this Capillo Beach um, in Hawaii. Um, they're collected uh, by the Smithsonian, um, who um, a researcher, materials, a material science researcher there, um, is collecting them and trying to actually figure out where they came from and what their, their um, chemical composition might be. And plastic is actually incredibly difficult to discern those kinds of, um, that kind of information from. And it's designed to be that way. So the ways in which they actually can date plastic, is, it's far easier to do that through the history of design rather than the history of, of um, its actual chemical composition. It's incredibly difficult once a polymer is formed to be able to break it apart and figure out what the kind of chemical signature is of that. And of course, those things are also protected by proprietary secrets. So um, companies won't disclose what kinds of chemical formulas they're using um, to be able to create particular products because it's not of benefit to them. Um, so it's actually through, um, you know, like if you know that a particular toy was made in 1984, for example, then you can date that particular plastic object back to 1984. But otherwise, we have um, very few mechanisms for being able to tell when a particular plastic product was made or where it came from. Um, and this, uh, this, this is what I'm arguing is... Um, a kind of universality. So plastic embodies this kind of notion of universalism in a way in which um, other uh, objects simply cannot. Everything is incredibly historical because of this question of metabolism, because you're constantly in this process of becoming in and with your surrounds and in this, this process where, where everything is becoming a part of one's own body, whether one is the earth or one is a... Um, a lemur. Um, <laughs> I was trying to think of an animal. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you're con you're always a historical. <laughs> you're always a historical being. Um, but plastic is really designed to try to extend outside of that historicity. Um, I mean, whether it does this perfectly or not, I mean, that, that's that that I think is an open debate. But but it's designed to be universal. It is meant to be standardized. Um, it's meant to be a standard object. It's not meant to be an individualized object. There is no local for something like plastic. Um, and uh, this actually ends up um, having, um, I mean, this is the reason why you can actually recycle plastic from all kinds of different streamlines and sources is that as long as you know what kind it is, you know, PVC versus polyethylene or whatever, um, then you can put it in, you can uh, at least hypothetically put it in the same uh, kind of stream and, and produce new objects out of it. Um, but it really is designed to be infinitely reproducible and without any kind of localized signature. Um, so uh, so in, it, because of this, uh, plastic... Um, Andrew uh, Boetskis, um, or sorry, uh, Andrew Pendakis and Amanda Boetskis 
right? The plastic defi defies ontological categories. So they say, indeed, plastic is less a substance than its antithesis, a paradigm in which <laughs> substance is transformed into a way of being unmoored from the coordinates that stabilize presence and meaning. Um, and I think that that's an incredibly interesting way of thinking about it. Plastic is precisely this um, process of unmooring right, oneself. And what I would argue um, it means to be earthbound, it means to be an earthly creature, it means to be of the earth, is exactly the opposite. It means a process of mooring. Right? It means this process of enfolding and enfolding um, to be form, uh, to form and to be informed by enmeshed relations to minerals, animals, water, air, to processes of change, transformation, and metabolism. Plastic is instead just a surface, and it's a surface all the way through. There's no differentiation um, between the inside of a plastic object and the outside of a plastic object. It's exactly the same. Um, it's exactly the same repeated chemical signature um, uh, throughout the entirety of the object. Um, and nothing else that I can think of is like this. Um, and so plastic, because of this, because of its surfaceness, because of its universality, because of its endless replicability, and, dis and because of, it, of its quality of unmooring, um, is despite being insinuated into the geological layer, remains separated from the earth. So um, it's normally referred to as a, as a chemical that's a hydrophobe, meaning that um, it repels water. But I would also argue that it's some kind of a geophobe um, because it refuses the relations uh, to the minerals and air uh, that all other creatures um, have, and rocks and all these other things. So... Um, Plastic is designed to be all surface all the way through with no variation and no history. We use it so widely because it can become anything, infinitely transformable and manipulable to the wills and whims of human invention. Um, plastic removes itself from a standard ontological category because it, by design and of necessity, it is universal. It becomes universal as it is abstracted from the earth. Um, and as Esther Resley writes, um, in a brilliant book on artifice, nature, and the chemical industry, she writes, time's dominion was to be cracked. Through the accelerating power of chemical reaction, modern magic consists in the short-circuiting of natural processes. In time, technology remakes time itself, removing it from natural rhythms to an abstract universal. Plastics materialization of the universal can also be seen as the perfect extension of the logic of advanced petrocapitalism. Um, so, uh, so this is another example of the endless proliferation of the same or of the universal. Um, and and I, I, I write, the rapid proliferation of materials that have no relation to any particular place defies the logic of the earth itself and the reciprocal and relational ethics that we are called upon to listen to. Even in geology, rocks bear traces or an inscription of their history, determining and being determined by the activities of the creatures that reside, pass through, live and die within particular environments. The sense of ecology tied to a notion of placemaking um, is defied by materials such as plastic. So unlike all other kinds of ecological moments or any kind of an organism that is intimately tied to a particular place and to a particular locale, um, plastic doesn't have a local. Um, it doesn't have a locale. It has. It refuses to do this process of metabolization of the outside. It, there is no mechanism of enfolding, um, and there is no local for plastic. Um, instead, plastic exists everywhere and anywhere. Um, and plastic is always a sum or an any, never a this or a that. And it feels infinite because it sheds every trace of particularity, every index of a located space and time. It has no birthplace, no evolutionary home, no relation to its surrounds. Um, it has no umwelt in the sense that Jacob von Uxkel meant, um, which is that it, you know, each organism has its own particular world that's created by one sensory and perceptive uh, apparatuses, and, um, and plastic doesn't have that. Um, precisely because it's designed to be an infinitely reprodu reproducible, um, a universal object. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna um, 
switch, switch. So this is um, an Edward Bertinsky photograph. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit now um, and talk about the fact that this 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 logic of plastic, I think, has a much longer history than than the material itself. Um, the material itself comes about at the very beginning of the 20th century, um, or at least the first synthetic, purely synthetic molecule um, is invented in the the first decade of the of the 20th century. Um, but I would argue that um, that that this logic of defying place, the logic of, of the, um, the hubris of the universal has a much longer uh, history that, that, that I would like to argue um, is intimately linked with the process of colonization and especially settler colonialism, um, which uh, you, know, you can think of countries like Canada, the US, um, uh, um, New Zealand, Australia, those are prime examples of settler colonialism where the indigenous population um, was uh, subject to all kinds of genocidal measures um, and has essentially been displaced by um, a foreign population that, uh, or a settler population that, um, that remains on the land and, uh, but that the indigenous people are obviously still there. So, um, what I would, what the reason why I'm trying, what I, why I'm linking these these two categories is that settler colonialism has always been about changing the land. So we think of these as political processes. We think of these as processes in order to uh, gain access to particular resources or to gain access to um, labor. Uh, but actually, what settler colonialism uh, really was about was about instantiating a particular kind of universal that otherwise couldn't exist. So when settler population came um, to uh, you know Australia even though the the uh, land doesn't uh, call for agriculture in that particular place they did everything they possibly could including all these mining this mining of phosphorus in order to change uh, the landscape into one that would basically resemble England right and and so all of these processes um, transforming the earth including the creatures and the plants and the soil composition and the atmosphere all of those things have already happened and have been happening for an incredibly long period of time at least the last 500 years so settler colonialism was about moving and unearthing rocks and minerals. And uh, all of these acts were intimately tied to the project of erasure, which is what a settler colonialism about, is about. So I.L. Wiseman, writing about climate change in relation to Bedouin communities um, in, uh, in what is now known as Israel, um, could equally be writing about the wider processes of terraforming that defines uh, what we are now calling the Anthropocene. So he writes, if, however, following historian Deepesh Chakrabarti, we look at climate change from the point of view of the history of colonialism, we no longer simply see it as a collateral effect of modernity, but rather as its very target and aim. Um, indeed, colonial projects from North America through Africa, the Middle East, India, and Australia sought to re-engineer the climate. This was actually their explicit goal. Um, Colonizers did not only seek to overcome the unfamiliar and harsh climactic conditions, but rather to completely transform them. Native people who were seen as part of the natural environment were displaced along with the climate or killed. Uh, although the attempt was to make the desert green, instead the green fell fallow, lakes deadened, and oceans rose. So what settler colonialism and its extensions in contemporary petrocapital does is a severing of relations. It's a severing of this kind of process of metabolism. It's a severing of these processes of enfolding. It's a severing, it's a, it's a delocalized version of being in a place. So, um, so this is the logic of the Anthropocene. It is a severing of relations between humans and the soil, between plants and animals, between minerals and our bones. This is the logic that has resulted in the amalgamation of conditions that asks us to consider what we are writing into the body of the earth, as in uh, plastics, um, or in this example, as in um, industrial agriculture, or as in this example, uh, which is the tar sands um, in Alberta. So Kyle White, who is a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation, um, in, uh, which is uh, part of the Anishinaabe community, um, in um, which, which covers the eastern region of uh, Canada and the United States, 
um, also argues that the Anthropocene is the deliberate enactment of colonial processes that refuse, uh, refuse to acknowledge specific and locational relations between humans, the land, and other kin. The damming of river rivers, clear cutting of forests, and the Im importation of plants and animals remade the worlds of North America into the vision of a displaced Europe, fundamentally altering the climate and ecosystems. Um, so uh, I just want to, just a little caveat. Um, I'm sorry that I'm focusing so much on North America rather than the Barents region, but I, 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 would, I, would imagine that, I would imagine that there's probably parallels to be made. Um, but as somebody who is not from here, I feel like it's um, much better for me to comment on the place from which I am from if my whole entire argument is about <laughs> Uh, locality and place-based thinking. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just I'll continue from from what I know, um, which is uh, settler colonialism in North America and elsewhere is marked by this process of terraforming. So, as White argues, industrial settler campaigns erase what makes a place ecologically unique in terms of human and non-human relations and the ecological history of a place and the sharing of the environment by different human societies. And this isn't simply just a matter of of like, oh, you know, it's nice to know the place that you're in, or like, you know, it's good to be able to go out and fish or know which plants you can eat and not die. Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. It's actually a question, um, especially from indigenous communities in North America, this is a question of governance. So a lot of governance strategies are specifically centered around when you're supposed to harvest particular things. The entire government governance systems, gender systems as well, are organized around the particular ecologies in which um, those groups of people are enmeshed within. Um, so when you disrupt the processes by which uh, somebody can have a relation to a particular place, for example, through the forced displacement of all kinds of indigenous people from one part of North America to other parts of North America, um, then you're disrupting not only a particular, a particular relation to a particular plant or a particular animal, but you're also disrupting the processes of indigenous governance systems. You're disrupting processes of gender systems. Um, all of these systems that go along entire epistemologies and ontologies and worlds, ways of being in the world, become disrupted when you move. Or in the alternate case, which is with the process of settler colonialism, um, when the land itself is no longer the land, uh, the land that you were born into no longer exists. So you know, if you're somebody um, who is probably from this part of the world or um, in other parts of the Arctic, um, where things are changing so incredibly rapidly uh, that you can no longer um, do the kinds of um, activities that you can't go out on the land in the way you, the ways that you used to be able to because the ice will literally crack under your feet. Um, those things are disrupting entire, an entire sense of being in the world. Um, so, uh, and, and one that's Im imposing a particular kind of universal logic uh, that is um, fundamentally against the process of, of the earth. Now, uh, Lawrence Gross, um, who's also Anishinaabe, writes, one critical aspect of exploring the reality of Native American history is to correctly name the experience Native Americans have suffered and which they continue to endure this day. And um, Kyle White argues that the, the name of the suffering is climate change, and other people have argued this as well. Um, and, and in the, this, he says, to put it in a word, um, Native America has seen the end of their respective worlds. So Native Americans have lived through the end of the world. Um, uh, using uh, vocabulary from the study of religion, this should be correctly termed an, or termed an apocalypse. Um, just as importantly, though, Indians survived the apocalypse. This raises the further question, then, of what happens to a society that has gone through an apocalyptic event, and the effects of the apocalypse linger on, and the history of apocalypse continues to be the current day reality for many Native Americans. They are faced with having to deal with the consequences of imposed cultural destruction. But I think that this is an incredibly pertinent question, not just for indigenous folks at this particular moment in time, but for all of us who are facing um, global climate change, which is just the, the ramping up of these processes that have, been, that have been happening for the last 500 years, and it's now beginning to affect everybody. And because of that, um, I think that there's um, an, a huge wealth of knowledge um, that, uh, that exists in multiple um, indigenous communities that, uh, that actually can um, 
provide ways of being that, and ways of understanding how to live through the process of the ending of worlds. So we, know, we don't know what's going to be happening in the next 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years, but we do know that there's going to be a rapid diminishment. And, because, and that diminishment has already been one that people have lived through. So perhaps it's actually incredibly important to maybe ask um, those people or start reading their work and engaging with them um, about, um, uh, about how to, how to um, develop strategies to be able to live through the end of the world. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about, um, about relationality. And I'm going to do it in kind of a, a, a little bit of a funny way. Um, uh, but I want to leave some time for questions, so I won't talk um, too much longer. Um, but um, relationality, obviously, uh, is, is um, an incredibly important concept um, for feminist thinkers, for lots of people of color thinkers, um, for indigenous thinkers, um, and also, I would argue, um, for beginning to reshape our understandings, to move away from this problem of the universal. So how do we, be, how do we begin to recompose with the world around us, and how do we, um, we begin uh, to reimagine uh, relationality. Um, uh, this is this is a funny example, uh, but uh, but I think I think I think it works in a in a kind of interesting way uh, that's maybe counterintuitive um, and kind of useful. Um, this is an artist called Dwayne Linklater. Um, he's Cree from Moose Cree First Nation in Northern Ontario, and uh, this is his recent work for the Salt Eleven um, exhibition, which was at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. And what he did was he took um, so there's all of these um, indigenous objects in their collection, um, and many of them are very poorly attributed. Um, they didn't they didn't really go through proper processes of uh, acquisition. There was basically no consent. Um, oftentimes, uh, people's uh, artists' names weren't recorded. Um, you know, all of these kinds of problems. So there was this complete kind of flattening. They wouldn't weren't even really sure where particular objects came from. So there was this complete fat flattening of indigenous epistemologies. And so what Dwayne did, what Dwayne Linklater did was he came in and he made these. Um, kind of like really terrible uh, 3D renderings <laughs> of, of the objects. And he deliberately, so he deliberately used, um, he never actually went down um, to UMFA. He, he just, he got somebody else to scan the objects and then sent him uh, the digital files. And then he deliberately um, produced the objects on these like consumer quality um, 3D printers rather than on um, industrial 3D printers that would have produced something with much more detail. Um, so, so you end up with this like, instead of of like this kind of like beautiful engraving, you sort of end up in this with just sort of a strange blob, um, and uh, and or, you know, or like in this in this case, it's like you know a similar kind of thing. And like if there's um, more resolution to these images, you could see you could see the fact that um, he also has kept all of the lines, like all of the sutures in the in the three D objects. So like you know the the places at which like you know the machine got stuck or there's like all of these glitches, they're all still maintained um, within the three D printed object. Um, um, and I think that this is like a really amazing uh, way of being able um, to talk about uh, colonial erasure, right? And to, like, and to talk about the kind of the lack, the the. It's it's an incredibly interesting way of reformulating plastic as this way in which to be able to talk about the problems of abstraction and universalism, but to do so in a way that actually engages um, in a kind of playful and critical fashion, and to um, and to really um, rethink, uh, ask, ask ask audiences to rethink these these processes of, of relationality and um, and uh, and the, the the museum practices of acquiring objects. This is another um, another example <laughs> of the three D the three D printed. So you know, like it's like, and and he does it in this like just sort of terrible um, beige. <laughs> color, um, <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like the cheapest, easiest version of, of 3D printing that you could probably um, do at home. Um, and, and, and I mean, I think that these uh, works sort of are like the, the zombie doubles of the original artifacts, right? They're like completely stripped of soul or life. Um, and they provide this incredible, um, incredibly brilliant comment on the way in which UMFA um, holdings are composed of these diminished relics. Um, but I think that they also maybe provide a way in which to rethink 
um, the processes of relationality um, for us in our contemporary age in a much more general sense. Um, so just to sort of finish, um, well, I was going to, I was going to, um, if we begin to take seriously the imperative from indigenous thinkers and elders, as well as feminist and other people of color thinkers, uh, to think about uh, relationality as central, how might our, how might our relation to plastic change? Um, obviously, Linklater's work is one, one example of that. Um, but thinking about, thinking about plastic instead of as this infinitely disposable material that has no relation to its particular location, instead, like, is there a way in which um, to, to engage with plastic um, and its critique by artists the, uh, through repurposing and hacking of systems of 3D printing? Um, perhaps there's a way in which, and the, and the ways in which um, um, plastics can now be domestically recycled uh, through a lot of these uh, kind of hacking systems. Is there a way in which um, uh, we might be able to rethink the kind of value of oil and the intimacy of oil in our in our everyday moments? And is there a way in which we might be able to render these kinds of things through glitches, through these um, these objects that are produced in a way that is um, that is imperfect? Is there a way that we can that we can kind of reassert a kind of relationality or a kind of locality that might uh, might might provide us for strategies in which to continue um, continue to survive and thrive on the planet and with others? Um, but these processes, so like regardless of the fact that I think that you know Linklater's work is amazing or um, the the possibilities of of three D printing and hacking um, are actually really quite interesting. Um, the underlying philosophical problems of universality, of colonialism, um, of the violences of extraction in general um, don't go away. And in the endless proliferation and replication of objects in our everyday lives, the space of critique is often not far away from complicity. It is negotiating the imminence of oil to provide glitches, cracks, and imperfect renderings that new imaginaries of plastic unfold. Um, and I'm just going to leave it there.